We continue today on this Memorial Day with our series entitled Letters, looking at some of the letters, Jude, Titus, Philemon, we've looked at. We started looking at uh, the letters of John, and we started in 1 John last week, and we're going to continue in 1 John this week, and next week we're going to wrap this series with 3 John. Our scripture today is 1 John chapter 5. It's a little long in some ways, but we're going to read the entire chapter. We're going to read this from the New King James Version, 1 John 5, and it reads as follows. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood, and is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning in a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give life, give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death, I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that, what, that whoever is born of God does not keep sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord, we come and we read these words that were written all those years ago, and yet they still speak truth to us today. And so in these few moments, may we find some truth in the midst of that that speaks into our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's obviously been a very interesting and somewhat hard week within our culture and our society. We hear of events that are going on and things that are happening. We hear of the things that that happened in Uvalde in Texas, and and, and it's just absolutely horrific. I wrote about it the other day on my Facebook page a little bit and talked about it, and, 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 and yet I'm not surprised in our culture how desensitized we've become to things like this, and, and it's going to become very politicized, and there's going to be arguments, and there's going to be arguments that are going to go counter of the Second Amendment, there's going to be arguments about life and children and stuff, and, you know, I had one of my friends post recently and said that, that, you know, the, the leading cause of death in, in children has moved from car accidents to gun violence. And I just wanted to tell her, no, that's not true. 
the leading cause of death is the 630,000 children that are aborted every year in America for convenience. And most of those happen for people between the ages of 20 and 29. And, 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 and they, there's always these sightings of what about these extreme situations and these extreme things. But the truth is 98% of the abortions that happen are simply matters of convenience. And we've desensitized ourselves to human life and the value of it. And, 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 and this is what's happening in, in Texas this week. There's just this devaluation of human life and, and people just don't care. And people just don't care. And we see it within our culture and it's hard and it's a, it's a continual downward spiral that we see. And yet if we go back and remember some of the things that we talked about as we look through Revelation, as we look through things, the truth is things are going to get worse before they get better. We would like for everything to get better. But at the same time, if God's people rise up, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, I will hear their voice. If they'll turn from their wicked ways, God says, I will hear them and I will, I will come and I will heal them and I will restore them. And so there is still hope within us who find ourselves as believers. And so we come to this God, this, these letters that John wrote all these years ago. And I would just want to remind us a couple things. John 1 was very old when he wrote these letters. We talked about it again in Bible study this past Wednesday night. But this was late, written in the late part of the first century. He was probably 85, 90 years old when he wrote these letters. And, and he sends them to the church and most likely to the church of believers in Ephesus. But we don't know that for sure. But that's just kind of what things look like. And he's talking to the church about what it means to know the love of God and to live in the love of God. And he's talking to the church and church leaders. And as he goes through this, this incredible letter that he's written, this first John is, is not a traditional letter. It's more like a sermon that has been put out there. And it's kind of a, it's a sermon that kind of goes in circles. It says one thing and another and goes back to another. And it's not linear, but he comes to this fifth chapter. And I spent some time with this fifth chapter this week and just looked at it. And sometimes without adding a whole lot of illustrations or other things, the Scripture just says what it needs to say and speaks to us. I looked at it, and I think there's four sections in this fifth chapter. I think there's four different things, and there's four different key points that are there. And I think the first section is verses 1 through 5, where, where the writer talks about what does it mean to be born of God. That's the first thing he talks about. And then he talks about this really, really key section. And we're going to spend a little bit of time here. And at the very end of the book is where we're, or the chapter is where we're going to look. But he talks about the source of our relationship with God. What is it that allows us to have a relationship with God? He talks about that. And then in 14, um, excuse me, verses 14 through 17. I'm sorry, there's a little typo there. In verses 14 through 17, he talks about what it means to be a praying Christian, how to help us out with that. What does that mean um, there? And then finally at the end, and this is the other section we're really going to kind of dwell on today, he talks about how do we protect our relationship with God. And we have the source of our relationship. How do we protect it and keep it strong? And remember, he is writing this letter to the church. And so the very first part that he talks about here is, is what it does it mean to be born of God. And he starts with these words, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now there's a couple key words I want to point out there. And the first one is this word, is. He doesn't say whoever believes Jesus was the Christ. He says whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. You remember earlier in this book, as John's writing, he's talking about, hey, I was one of the witnesses. I was there. I stood there. We, we talked this week again in Bible study that he was probably about the youngest of the disciples. He was, he was probably most likely the youngest, but he was the only one who stood there at the cross. He is the only one of the disciples who was there publicly seeing the crucifixion. He was the one that Jesus looked down from on the cross and said, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Take care of Mary, he said to John. And he looked down at him. And so he was there. He was an eyewitness of it. And he's writing this 50, 60 years after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And he doesn't say Jesus was the Christ. He says Jesus is the Christ. And he's going to, in this chapter, lay out the argument, not only is Jesus is the Christ, but Jesus is God in human form. 
It's an incredible, incredible argument. The other word there that's really important is that the word believe. This, this, this word right here is not just the word believe in as I know something. This is the word believe as in I have an intimate relationship with someone. I've talked about it before in Spanish. There's two words, there's two verbs to mean I know. There's the verb ser and there's the verb conocer. And if you say yo sé, which comes from ser, if you say I know something, it means I know a fact, I know a truth, I know something. If you say yo conozco, which comes from conocer, that means I know somebody. I have a relationship with them. I have an interaction with them. And right here he's saying whoever believes, whoever has this relationship, whoever knows the Christ, that's the one. And so he says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who was begotten by him. And so what does that mean right there? He's telling us, first of all, that nobody is earning salvation. He spent this whole book talking about if you love God, you must do these things. But he comes back and says, ultimately, it is not about what you do. It is about what you believe, who you know. And he says it's about Jesus. And then he says, secondly, if you know him, if you know him, then you also know those who are part of his family. That's what this whole line, who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten by him. And we could get caught up in the begots. And we don't want to get caught up in the begots. He's saying all of those who are loved. He says we must love our brothers and sisters. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a knowing of people and loving them. By this we know that we love who? The children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. He says, first of all, Jesus is the Christ. He doesn't say things like Jesus has the spirit of the Christ within him. This is something that you'll find in other religions and other forms where you talk about maybe Confucius or Muhammad or Buddha or, or many others that he kind of had the spirit. Or in the first century, in the second century, he talked about there's this group called the Gnostics. And they didn't even believe that Jesus was born of flesh and blood. We're going to see that again here in a minute. They just thought he was kind of the spirit that came here. And he's going, no, Jesus is the Christ. And because we love him, because of who he is, we also love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And it matters not the race, the class, the culture, the language, or any other thing. Anyone who claims birth in Jesus Christ, who actually knows Him, who actually has relationship with Him, is our brother and sister in Christ. And someday we're all going to stand in front of Him, and all those other things aren't going to matter a whole lot. They're all going to disappear to love all others in the family of God means you do not limit your love to your own denomination, your own group, to your own social or financial status, to your own race, to your own political perspective, or to your exact theological persuasion. If any of these things more to us than our common salvation and the common lordship of Jesus Christ, something is very, very wrong. And John starts this last chapter and says, anyone who believes, anyone who knows, anyone who has this relationship with Christ is part of the family. And because we're all part of the family, we must love each other. And I think that's powerful. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. We've talked about this multiple times. Our salvation does not come through anything we do. It comes through that belief. It comes through that faith. But if we have that faith, then our lives change and our hearts change and we must love. And when we fail during the week, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute when he talks about sin here in a little bit, we are going to fail. But it's not, is it a one-time failure or is it an ongoing life of failure and denial? And there's a huge difference between this. A Christian, I read somebody this week who wrote, a Christian who does not love God or keep his commandments of, is of little effective use in the body. Even if she or he or she is involved in the ministry or holds a high position in the church, if we do not do it out of love, it means absolutely nothing. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And then there's this great little line. See, he says, if you really believe, you're going to keep God's commandments. And then he says this nice little thing, and His commandments are not burdensome. 
Sometimes people look at the church. Sometimes people look at being a Christian and think, oh man, there's all these rules, there's all these regulations put on us. And yet, John is writing that they're not burdensome. In fact, I think he can remember when Jesus said, come to me all ye who are weary and heavy laden and take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is light. And he remembers this. And, and what Jesus is saying, what John is saying is, look, we grew up in a culture, and remember, he's writing to the church. He's writing to people who grew up in a certain culture where the religious leaders of the day put all these rules on top of everybody. you got to do this. We don't just have the Ten Commandments. We have the Talmud. We have the 621 other rules. We have this you can't do on the Sabbath, and this you can't do on the Sabbath. And John says, you got to throw it all away, and it comes to this, love God and keep his commandments. And the commandments are pretty simple when you compare what man tries to put on you. Keep his commandments. And he says, so keep them. There's, there's basically 10 of them. There's basically 10 of them. And the first four say, love your God above all else. And the other six say, love mankind and everything that you do. And that's what John's saying. So he says, they're not burdensome. And sometimes Christians feel that, oh, I've, if I become a Christian, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And the reality is, you become a Christian, it's not about what you can't do, it's about what you can do. It's about the freedom, it's about the life. And so he says, the commandments are not burdensome they're not there to bind or give us pain in fact God knows that if we live the life that he outlines for it that our life becomes what fuller and more abundant I have come to give life and to give life more abundantly in John chapter 10 he writes about this and again in this he's writing about it and so we we become this and, and we are not burdensome John is not trying to say obedience is an easy thing he's not saying it's easy but he's thinking about the contrast against all the stuff that mankind tries to put on us and especially religious leaders and he's just saying, nah, just love God and love people. It's that simple. And it really is. You know, if we loved God and loved people, so much of what happened this week would not have happened. If parents had loved a child, if people had loved each other, if we had looked out for each other, if we'd have cared about each other, if we'd have been willing to lay our lives down for somebody else, so much could have been avoided of what went on this week. God's commandments are not burdensome. They're simply love God, love man. What an incredible thing. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. I've had this weird line that's just been in my mind all week, and I, I can't figure out why it's there. And, and, and I just keep thinking, I don't question your belief, but I do question your faith. And I'm trying to figure out sometimes, because we use believe so flippantly sometimes, we throw it away, and, and, and faith is this idea of, man, it's so much more. Faith is being hopeful of things that we don't see, being sure of what we don't know. Faith is living in such a way, and, and, and he writes it here, he says, you know, you gotta, gotta believe, you gotta believe, but your belief has to be faith. Your belief has to be trust in something beyond who you are. Who is he who overcomes the world? He who believes what? That Jesus is the Son of God. And he says we can overcome the world. The idea that anything, anything born of God could be defeated by this world is strange to John. He doesn't see how anything from God can be beaten by this world, especially for those who believe in Jesus Christ. And this isn't the come to the altar, get saved, put your name on the piece of paper and be on the church roll type of faith. This is a consistently abiding, ongoing reliance and trust upon Jesus Christ. And he says, who overcomes? Whoever believes in Jesus Christ. And knowing who Jesus is, not just as a matter of fact, but as, as food for life, as a connection, as a relationship, leads to overcoming the world. And this was a section I wasn't going to talk a whole lot about. And so we'll go to the next one. The source of our relationship with God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is a spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. Now there's a lot of talk in, among theologians. Among most people there's not. But among theologians there's a lot of talk. Is what does it mean that Jesus came by water and blood? First of all, this is John's way of saying, let me tell you that Jesus was here, real, physical form. At this time in the late 1st century, early 2nd century, I mentioned this earlier, he's fighting against, there's a, a, a school of thought out there called Gnosticism, which basically said Jesus was just a spirit. And John's saying, no, he wasn't just a spirit, because if he's just a spirit, it doesn't work. He has to be human. And so he comes as water and blood is the way he comes. And, and, and there's a lot of disagreement by water and blood. I'm going to look at some of the, 
things that are said. Some believe that water speaks of our own baptism, and some think that it talks about the blood is talking about our receiving communion. But I don't think that's what John is saying right here. But some do that. Luther and Calvin actually held to that idea. But I don't think that's what John's saying. Um, Others do believe that the water and blood describes the water and blood which flowed from Jesus' side when he was poked with the spear, when he was stabbed with the spear, when he was on the cross. One of the soldiers came and water and blood came out. And John even wrote about this in the 19th chapter of the gospel, 1934. And it was important to him because if it wasn't, he wouldn't have written about it and he was there. But I still don't think that's what he's talking about here. Some of this believe that water spoke of Jesus' first birth, being born in the waters of the womb, and blood speaks of his death. And, and if this is the case, John would be saying Jesus was born like a man and died like a man. And I don't think that's what he's saying either. So what does this water and blood? Most likely means the water of Jesus' baptism and the blood of his crucifixion. Not our baptism and communion. The water of Jesus' baptism and the blood of his crucifixion. Because when Jesus was baptized, he was not baptized in repentance for his own sin. When Jesus was baptized by John, he did it because he wanted to identify fully and completely with sinful humanity. God in human form says, I want to identify with you, so I want to go through this. And it's a way of saying, I am here, I am with you, I am one of you, I am going through this. And when Jesus died on the cross, he did not die because he had to, because death could have no power over God. None. But he died and laid down his life. Why? To identify with humanity yet again. And so God comes in human form and He comes by water and blood. He identifies with humanity in life. He identifies with humanity in death. And He says, guess what? I'm the God who's greater than all of it. And it has no hold on me. And so when John writes that, that, that He comes in this verse, He says He comes by water and blood. Jesus Christ not only by water, but by water and blood. He didn't just get baptized to identify with us. He died to identify with us in the death that we're going to have. And the Spirit bears witness, because the Spirit is truth, that Jesus Christ is still alive because He keeps talking about Him in the present tense. And so he comes by water and blood and to come all over this. And we have these great verses that are here that we're not going to spend a lot of time with. In fact, verse 7 is a very controversial book verse in much of the Scripture as to when it first appeared in Scripture and all these things. We're not going to go there today. But if you ever want to ask me about it sometime, I'll, actually on Wednesday night, I'll fill you in on that a little bit. And, and there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Those things come and say, this one right here, this is God in human flesh, and they agree they are one thing. And if we receive the witness of men, we've got to understand that God's witness, spirit, water, blood, is even greater than the witness of men. And so here is Jesus, and he's come, and he testifies through this. So he who believes in the Son of God has the witness himself. He who does not believe in God is calling God a liar. If you believe in God, you got it. If you don't believe, you're calling God a liar because God has said this is the way it is. This is who it is. This is how it's going to happen. This is the road to salvation. And if you don't believe that, you're calling God a liar. And if you do that over and over and over throughout your whole life, it falls under that whole idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because you're saying God's a liar. And what is the one unforgivable sin that is there? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit by calling God a liar, by saying that his son is not who he says. And this is the testimony. This is the truth. This is what happens because of the Son. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. That's it. That's the whole thing. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is powerful stuff. This is stuff that John writes to us that says it's really this simple and sometimes we make it really really complicated and it comes down to this you either know jesus or you don't acts 4 12 tells us there is one name under heaven given mankind whereby they must be saved and it comes to this you either know jesus or you don't know jesus he's either in your life or he's not and then this passage goes on and we're really going to hit quickly on these these things I've written you that you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Right here, he wraps this whole thing. He says, here's why I'm writing all this down to you. Here's why I'm sending it all to you, so that you don't doubt what you believe. 
Remember, he's writing to the church here. He's not writing to the unbeliever at this point. He says, I want you to know that you have eternal life. What you believe is true, and I want you to continue believing it. Don't let go of your faith. Hold fast to your faith and keep on going. And then he talks about, now how does this translate into help for praying Christians? We're going to go through this part really, really quickly right here. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. It all bases right here in this 14 out of 14 through 17. Sometimes we think, I asked God and he didn't answer me. Boy, I hate that. I hate when I say people said, well, I prayed to God and I didn't get an answer. You always get an answer. You always get an answer. It's either yes or no or not now. It's one of those three. But what is the key to prayer? If we ask anything according to His will. And the only way we can ask according to His will is to be fully in with the Son. And if we know the Son and if we're in with the Son, then we can be in to His will and we can ask according to His will and we have resources to examine what His will is and we can ask of that. And we know that if it's asking according with God's will and in His timing, that He's going to give us an answer. Sometimes we may not like the answer, by the way. Sometimes we may not like it. I know many times I don't. But He says, ask according to my will. And be assured that he hears us. And he says, ask in prayer. Ask in prayer. It doesn't say not to ask. It says God would have us ask anything in prayer. It doesn't imply that anything we ask will be granted. But anything that we can and should ask about, we should be praying for, for everything. God cares about our whole life and nothing is too small. And he wants us to do it according to his will because he is concerned about our well-being. It is a God who loves us, and so we want to pray in His will. And does God need our prayers to do what God wants to do? No, but does God want our prayers? Yes. God wants relationship with us. And, and, and because God has appointed us to work with Him. 2 Corinthians 6 1 calls us workers together with God. And because He's called us to work with Him, He wants us to work with Him and bringing our will and our agenda into alignment with His. And sometimes prayer isn't so much about what God's going to do, it's about what it does for us and how it changes us and how it brings us in line. And He wants to care about our brothers and sisters in these next few verses that we're not going to spend a whole lot of time with. It just talks about how we should care and pray for each other. We should care and pray for each other. And that there is sin in the world. And that there is sin in the world, but we should pray and care for each other. And this is great stuff we should go back and look at sometime, but we're going to move on. Protecting our relationship with God. This is important. He says, look, you've got to be born of Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. To do it, the only way to get a relationship with God is to believe in Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you care for, you love each other. But when you have that relationship, you've got to protect it and hold on to it. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Now let me, get, let me go to this real quick. It doesn't say that we, it, the, the, the wording here, it's important to understand the language if you want to go back and study it. It's not talking about, oh, I went out, whoops, I sinned today. It's talking about this sin that is a continuing, ongoing lifestyle. Whoever is born of God does not live in a continuing, ongoing lifestyle of sin. It does not. Does it mean we're going to fail? No, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But it means the one who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. And this word that is there, touch, this word that is there and it, it talks about touch, it also means to grasp or to cling to. In fact, in John's Gospel, he writes about when Mary comes to Jesus, Mary Magdalene and stuff, and she's, she's holding on to him and stuff. And he's like, woman, don't hold on to me. Don't cling to me. Don't cling to me and he's saying here if you're born of God the wicked one cannot cling to you and hold on to you because God is greater than that one and so there's no ongoing lifestyle of sin there's an ongoing lifestyle of following the commandments and when one stumbles and falls one gets right back up and brushes the evil one off boom no because greater is he that is in me than is he that is in the world. And we know that we are of God, and we know that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You want to know why what happened happened in Texas this past week? Because evil is alive and well. 
in our world. And because Satan has a plan and he wants to distract us from us, and you can take any other political agenda, anything else you want to put into it, the fact is there is evil. But ultimately, God will triumph. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. And this is one of the strongest statements talking about the deity of Jesus. Earlier we talked about the humanity of Jesus, water and blood. This is one of the strongest statements in all of Scripture at the end of this verse. This is the true God and eternal life. And John gives us this incredible doctrine that has been discussed by theologians for years. And guess what? We'll never understand until we stand face to face in front of God that says Jesus was 100% fully man and Jesus was 100% fully God. And he says right here, this world has no hold on you because death, hell, and the grave have no power over you because of Jesus Christ. This is the true God. This is God in human flesh. And you've got to believe it. And so his argument comes back to where it started from. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ, this is the true God. And this, if this is the true God, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. And that's what the fifth chapter is all about. It's about knowing and remembering. And John is looking back on this day, and, he, and, and he's writing old, old age in his life, looking back on everything he's learned, and he's going, Jesus is still alive. He's still God. He's still on the throne. And everything I remember from my youth from 50 years ago is still real today. And I want to share it with the church. And then he does this really neat little thing to end this sermon, this letter. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Now that might seem in some ways a strange way to end it, but it really fits because it's about a, li a real living relationship with God. It's about believing in Christ. It's about knowing Christ. This whole letter that he's written, this whole sermon that he's preached, it's about all these things. It's about living and following God's commandments, loving people by doing what God has said. Love God, love people over and over again. And so he comes to this and he, he, he has this little thing. And, and the idea of adult idolatry is simply a, embracing a false god. He says, don't embrace a false god. Charles Spurgeon did. Let's see if I can find my notes on this. He did this great sermon years ago. And, and, and he notes, first of all, that, that John calls the people little children. He looks at that and he says, little children. And, and, and Spurgeon said this. He said, it's a title of deep affection. It's a title that indicates regeneration and a family relationship. It's a title that indicates humility. It's a title that indicates teachableness. It's a title that implies faith. It's a title that implies weakness. He's saying all these things. When, when John's writing, he's saying, you are part of the family. You can be taught. You can learn. You can grow. You must have faith. You're little children. You're just starting on this journey. And I think it's really neat that John wrote this because he's like, I'm at the end of my journey here. Little children. But then he says, keep yourselves from idols. It speaks against the obvious visible idols, but it's, it speaks against worshiping ourselves. It speaks against overindulgence in food or drink or laziness or, 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 or by how we look or what we wear, Spurgeon said. It speaks against worshiping wealth. It's, it speaks against worshiping some hobby or pursuit. It speaks against worshiping friends or relatives. He says, keep yourselves from anything that will keep you from the relationship with God. I think this is an incredibly powerful book that we don't look at. And I think the basics of it are real, real simple. Jesus is the Christ, God in flesh, 100% man, 100% God. Must believe in that because through that is salvation. And if you believe in that, you have salvation. If you don't, you're calling God a liar and you don't have salvation. And if you say you believe in it, you must love each other. That's the book of 1 John. Lord, thank you that we can come into this place today and that we can, we can study this book and these words and these letters. And on this day that we call Memorial Day where we remember those who have given so much that we may have freedom here, ultimate sacrifices. Lord, we, we please remember the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus paid that we can have freedom forever and ever. Thank you. Thank you for words that remind us. Thank you for reality. May we be a people who believe 
May we understand what Jesus, what you did for us here. And may we grasp hold of it and may we use that as a springboard to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go to a song that kind of sums that up a little bit. We actually did this song last year on Memorial Day. I looked back in my, my notes a little bit, but it's one of my favorites. It says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe.